Good morning, my name is Kayla. I'm, and my name is Kobe, and this semester we're working on a project using yeast as a model for type 2 diabetes, and specifically trying to understand how the glucose transporter HXT4 functions, and we were advised by Dr. Swain in the biochemistry department. So this is just a little overview of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with an introduction followed by our preliminary data that led us to our hypothesis. And then this is kind of more of a twofold project. So I focused on wet lab experimentals and Kobe kind of looked more at computational side of things. And then we're just going to tell you about our conclusions and areas of future research. So in your body, when the sugar glucose enters your bloodstream, it triggers the release of a hormone known as insulin. And so if you think of yourself as being like a house, then insulin is like this person knocking on the door and saying, open up and let the glucose in. So in healthy cells, the doors will open and allow glucose to pass into the cell. But in people with type 2 diabetes, their body is still producing insulin, but the cell doesn't answer this knock. And so this leads to high levels of glucose in the blood known as hyperglycemia because it's not being adequately transported into the cells. And so over time, hyperglycemia can lead to organ damage, including to the eyes, kidneys, nerves, and heart. And the World Health Organization estimates that type 2 diabetes affects over 400 million people worldwide. And so having a better understanding of how glucose transporters work, which here would be the door, is important for developing better ways of treating type 2 diabetes. So glucose transport into the cell kind of occurs through facilitated diffusion and in this process glucose from outside of the cell is able to enter into the cell through these transporter proteins. And in humans these are called glucose transporter proteins or glutes for short and in yeast they're called hexose transporter proteins or HXTs. And when the cell senses this glucose in the extracellular matrix as seen in this image it's able to move these different transporter proteins into the plasma membrane. And once they're there, the glucose is able to use them as kind of like a channel to enter the cell. And in particular, yeast can tolerate a wide range of glucose levels because there are two types of hexose transporter proteins. The first is a high affinity transporter, which are only expressed under low levels of glucose. And the second is a low affinity transporter, which are only expressed in high levels of glucose. And our particular protein of interest for this study, HXT4, is a high affinity transporter, meaning again, it's only expressed under low levels of extracellular glucose. And so before we go any further, you're gonna hear us use these words N and C termini a lot today. And so it's important to talk about what that means. And so proteins are the real workhorses in your cell and they do everything from help you sense light to transporting glucose. And proteins are made of these building blocks called amino acids. And so if you've ever made something like a paperclip chain, it's a similar concept where the paperclips would be amino acids. And so every amino acid has a carboxyl end that we call the C terminus and an amino end that we call the N terminus. And there's also this R group, which can be a number of different side chains that give it its physiochemical properties. And so just like the paperclip chain analogy, we can connect amino acids to one another using something called a peptide bond, which would be these gray lines between the dots here. And so this peptide bond joins together the N terminus of one amino acid with the C terminus of another. And as you can see, no matter how many of these amino acids we join together, we're always gonna have an N terminus and a C terminus. And then for H64, it's the N terminus and C terminus are both located inside the cytoplasm. And so for our purposes, what we call the N terminus is from the beginning of the protein to right before it enters the membrane for the first time. And then the C terminus is from right where it comes out of the plasma membrane for the last time until the end of the protein. So as the name of our presentation kind of suggests, we're using yeast as a model, and we did this for a variety of different reasons. Not only are yeast hexose transporters homologs to human glucose transporters, but yeast is also a good model for glucose transport studies because it's inexpensive, it replicates quickly, we had a variety of different mutants available to us, it has a fully sequenced genome, and it shares a lot of similar pathways with other mammalian cells. So as Kayla said, we're using yeast as a model organism to study diabetes. And so not a lot is really known about how glucose transporters work in yeast. And so one of the ways that we can characterize a transporter's function is through its growth on different um, media types. So Kayla will talk more about that later. But so Dr. Swain had previously done some growth studies using different strains of yeast. And so in the first row here, we're looking at the growth of a strain that's an HXT4 overexpressor, meaning that it just keeps producing the protein without ever slowing down. And so in the first column, this is a plate with 2% glucose, which is considered a normal level of glucose. And then the second column is 0.05 glucose, 
which is considered low glucose. So you can see the HXT4 overexpressor grows on normal glucose, but not on low glucose. And then in the bottom row, we have a yeast mutant that's an RBS161 delete, and this is an endocytic mutant, meaning that it can't bring those transporter proteins back out of the membrane when they're no longer needed. And so the, RB, the RBS161 mutant, just like the HXT4 overexpressor, can grow on normal glucose, but is not able to grow on low glucose. And so we call this inability to grow on low glucose, the low glucose defect. And so when the HXT4 overexpressor and the RBS161 mutant were combined together into a hybrid strain, then that strain was able to grow on normal glucose. And interestingly, it was also able to grow on low glucose. So this means together, the HXT4 overexpressor and the RBS161 mutant can suppress the low gluco glucose defect. And so this is what really got our attention here and that we're starring that section um, with the yellow star. So this kind of led Kobe and I to dive into the literature and start really thinking about what could be contributing to this phenotype. And one paper in particular stuck out to us and so in this paper, the data suggested that GLUT1 monomers initially associate as end-to-end -end terminal dimers, which is what's seen in the left figure. And so these dimers were then able to form tetramers stabilized by interactions between nearby C termini of the four monomers, which is what's seen in the right image. And the formation of these tetrameric complexes in turn enhanced glucose transport activity and glucose uptake because in this higher order oligomer, you now have an endofacial and an exofacial surface that allows for easy transport in and out of the cell. So basically this just means that there's always two catalytically available sites and that when one changes conformation, the other follows. Similarly, in this paper, it was suggested that intramolecular disulfide bonds, meaning disulfide bonds that form between residues of the same transporter, stabilize the structure. And so I'll talk more on this later. And so we hypothesis we hypothesize that HXT4 transporters exist as oligomers, and that this oligomerization is initiated by intramolecular interactions between the N and C termini of HXT4. So diving into the wet lab research of the study, you're probably going to hear me say the words "yes" followed by a number. So I just kind of wanted to let you know exactly what that means. Yes stands for yeast Evelyn Swain because all experiments were done using yeast strains that she provided for me. And so in this table, I just kind of indicated all the strains that I've used in my experiments. And I know it kind of looks like a lot, but I'm going to let you know in each experiment which ones I use and why. And I do want to point out at this time, however, that the wild type was used as a positive control because it has no mutations or variations and it's just pretty much what you would find outside the lab setting while the null strain was used as a negative control because all the transporters were knocked out. So my first step was more to confirm the preliminary data and the relationship seen between RBS-161 delete and the HXT4 overexpressor. So as Kobe said, the RBS-161 is responsible for the formation of endocytic vesicles at the plasma membrane, which plays a really important role in the transporter's function because this endocytosis of transporters is needed to maintain glucose homeostasis, which is something we don't really see in patients with type 2 diabetes, for instance. Again, as Kobe stated, the RBS-161 delete has a low glucose defect that is suppressed by the HXT4 overexpressor. But what RBS-161 also has is a non-fermentable carbon source defect. And basically, this just means that it's unable to use the electron transport chain to metabolize non-fermentable carbon sources. And what this picture here is showing is that in general, once a carbon source is actually able to get into the cell and go through glycolysis, it has two different options. The first is when there's no free oxygen available, it goes through fermentation. But when there is oxygen present, then it takes a different path into the mitochondria and cellular respiration occurs. And of course, because all of our cells grew in the presence of oxygen, this is the path that our yeast like to take. But remember, RBS-161 delete has this non-fermentable carbon source defect, meaning that even when there's oxygen available, it can't utilize the electron transport chain. And so cellular respiration gets all messed up and the RBS-161 delete can't use either pathway, which is just kind of what this table is showing. So basically it was our thinking that since the RBS-161 and the HXT4 overexpressor both have the same low, glu low glucose defect, 
then maybe, just maybe, then the HXT4 overexpressor might have a similar non-fermentable carbon source defect that would then give us insight into the transporter's function that's important for maintaining glucose homeostasis. So to do this, we looked at the growth of the wild type, the RVS161 delete, the HXT4 overexpressor, the HXT4 overexpressor with the RVS161 delete, and the null strain on fermentable carbon sources versus non-fermentable carbon sources. So as seen in the tables, the fermentable carbon sources I used were glucose, sucrose, fructose, galactose, and maltose, while the non-fermentable carbon sources I used were acetate, ethanol, glycerol, and lactate. So their growth was just characterized here on the tables for easy comparison, where basically the minus means that there was no growth at all, and the three pluses mean the growth was pretty much similar to the wild type. So to easily compare the growth in the phenotypes of these strains on each carbon source, I did a frogging experiment. And that's what you see on in the left image. And basically frogging is just an experiment that lets us use a one to 10 serial dilution of each strain to see how they're able to grow on different media. Overall, the fermentable carbon sources, we pretty much saw what we expected and it just confirmed that there was nothing unusual about our strains. But the non-fermentable carbon sources are what we're really interested in here because it confirms that the HXT4 overexpressor also shows the same respiration defect as the RBS161 delete. However, unlike on low glucose, the two, when combined, were not able to co-suppress one another's defects. So overall, this just kind of suggests that while the respiration defect seen in HXT4 overexpressor it's there, but since they're not able to co-suppress each other, it kind of alludes to the fact that this respiration defect may not be as important in the transporter's actual function as we initially thought. So instead, I began looking more at the structure of the transporters themselves to understand how they work. And so as I said earlier, we came across a paper that suggests intramolecular disulfide bonds were important in stabilizing the transporter proteins so that they could then oligomerize and form higher order tetramers like we hypothesized. The paper I read briefly mentioned two compounds that affect disulfide bonds, um, angeli salt and dithioretinol, but I'm just going to say DTT because that's a lot easier for me to say. Um, so basically, this paper found that when angeli salt was introduced, glucose uptake increased four to six fold. So angeli salt is a nitroxyl donor, and as seen in figure A, nitroxyl is the real star of the reaction. In general, it's an oxidizing compound that induces disulfide bonds in hydrophobic environments because it's able to easily react with two cysteine residues. One thing I do want to point out, however, is that in this paper, it was done in human glutes, but because, like we said earlier, HXTs are homologs to glutes, and because HXT4 has 12 cysteine residues, we kind of believe that it would act the same in yeast. So moving on to the bottom figure, the paper mentioned DTT as a reducing agent in a way to break disulfine bonds, but we didn't have DTT in our lab, so we used a similar reducing agent called beta mercapta ethanol, or BME. And that's what's seen in figure B. So BME breaks disulfide bonds, which pretty much just messes up their tertiary and quaternary structure, meaning they're less likely to fold properly and form these higher order complexes. So basically in our lab, we just wanted to see what would happen if we introduced nitroxyl and BME into the yeast cells. But we pretty quickly ran into some problems because in the reference paper, they measured glucose uptake in the treated cells directly using radioactively labeled glucose which of course we can't do at PC. So instead we just decided to use HXT2P GFP tagged mutant as a tool. And that was a mouthful, but basically here the transporter protein is tagged with GFP or the green fluorescent protein. So even though we can't really measure glucose uptake directly, we're still able to look at this mutant under the fluorescent scope. If it's in the membrane, then we can infer that glucose would be taken up more readily. So I know what you're probably thinking, I thought that you guys were doing HXT4, not 2. Well, this is another problem we ran into. We didn't have an HXT4 tagged mutant in the lab. However, like HXT4, HXT2 is also a high affinity transporter and expressed in low levels of glucose, which is what the top image here is showing. So it was just kind of our next best option. And then the table down below is just showing the yeast mutants we used for this experiment. We used the wild type plus GFP, the null plus GFP, and the one through seven delete GFP. 
And we chose these particular strains because each have a different amount of glucose transporters actually present in the cell, which is what the second column is showing. So we looked at these strains under three different conditions, one with no treatment, which is the control, one with angelic salt, and one with BME. What we expected to see was an increase in the protein in the membrane when angelic salt was added because it promotes intramolecular disulfide bonds, which of course we hypothesized were important in oligomerization and a decrease of transporters in the membrane when BME was added because it kind of has the opposite effect where it's breaking disulfide bonds. However, this is not what we saw. And as you can see in the third column of the image to the left, it actually looks like there's more transporters in the membrane when BME was added compared to the control and angeli salt, meaning the protein was actually more likely to move to the membrane under reducing conditions. And although it's harder to see in the wild type and one through seven delete, it's very obvious in the null strain. Similarly, the angeli salt treated cells all had really big vacuoles, which was kind of strange because it was almost like the transporters were getting stuck before they could even go to the membrane. And then the last thing I wanted to point out about this data is that in YES151 treat it with angeli salt in the very top left corner, it looks like the transporters were getting stuck in the cytosol, which is what the table on the right is indicating. And so just to sum this up, although I did not really have time to quantify these results and we weren't able to measure glucose uptake directly, this alone just kind of showed the opposite of what we were expecting. So one explanation for this could be that the angeli salt was oxidizing the first thing it saw, even if it was not necessarily the transporters, or that it was forming disulfide bonds where it was not supposed to, affecting the protein's natural fold and interactions. And lastly, like I kind of mentioned before, it's possible that the disulfide bonds were forming before it, the transporter could go into the membrane, and so they were kind of clumping up in the vacuoles or cytosol instead. However, of course, it is important to remember the limitations we faced, um, such as time restraints, having to use the HXT2 GFP rather than HXT4, and not being able to directly measure glucose uptake. And so my part of this project was all computational. And so what that means is I used something called molecular dynamic simulations to see if the termini of HXC4 interact. And so like Kayla mentioned earlier, GLUT1 initially associates as end to end terminal dimers. And so I was looking to see if that termini dimerization also occurred in HXT4. And so there are currently no crystal structures for any of these glucose transporters. So you can think of a crystal structure kind of like a snapshot of the protein, and it gets the X, Y, and Z coordinates for every atom in the protein structure. And so since I didn't have a crystal structure, I had to build the structure for each terminus from scratch. And so I started with the amino acid sequence for each terminus, and I used a Python package called Peptide Builder. <clears throat> and what Peptide Builder does is it takes that amino acid sequence, and it builds a linear, linear chain of amino acids. Um, so kind of like what we talked about earlier with that paperclip chain. And so once I had two linear chains, I anchored the residues so that the first, they would, the first ones inside of the membrane so that they couldn't move during the simulation. And this essentially would mimic what it would be like if they were connected to the rest of the transporter. And so I then moved the termini so that they would be 10 angstroms apart. And this was just an estimate of how far apart they would be if the two transporters were right next to each other in the membrane. And so the next step was energy minimization. And what this does is it tries to find the local minimum in the energy by varying atom positions and calculating the energy. And so I have this question mark here because like I said before, this is a linear sequence of amino acids and we don't know if there's gonna be any secondary structure and it formed. So if it does form, we should see it occur in this minimization step. And then the next step is the actual molecular dynamics. And so molecular dynamics is a way of simulating the behavior of proteins and other molecules over time based on its phys physical properties of their atoms. And so for me, I was interested in seeing if the termini interacted with each other, um, which would indicate possible roles for oligomerization. And so I looked at three different combinations of H64, <clears throat> the N and C, the N and N, and then the C with C. <clears throat> so after I built the structures, I ran the actual simulations on the supercomputer using NAMD2. And so I did the simulations at 310 Kelvin using implicit solvent, and I initially ran them for 100 nanoseconds. So like I said, I did the three different combinations, the N and C, the N and N, and then the C and C. And so what you see here is a way that we can visualize what's actually happening in the simulation. And so on the big plot, we have time in nanoseconds on the x-axis, and then RMSD or root mean square deviation on the y-axis. <clears throat> 
And so RMSD is just the average of the distances between two groups of atoms. And so if we start from the first frame of the simulation and then compare it to every other frame of the simulation, what we're looking for are areas of plateau and that would indicate overall structural stable stabilization. So you can see there seem to be some plateau in the green line, which is the C and C determinant combination. <clears throat> But RMSD alone can be misleading because while two structures, when compared to a reference structure, can appear to have the same RMSD, they can have very different structures. And so we can get more information about what's actually happening if we use something called pairwise RMSD. And so in pairwise RMSD, each frame in the simulation is compared to every other frame in the simulation. And so the diagonal line here is the frame being compared to itself. And then we're interested in the dark areas around the diagonal because that would indicate areas of convergence or similar structures. And so now looking at the N and C and N and N combinations, I didn't really see any convergence. But when you look at the C and C combination and this um, pairwise combination in the small graph on the um, far, far right here, I did see this area of convergence toward the end, and I've highlighted it here in a red box. And so after I saw that potential possible convergence at the end of the CC terminus combination, I ended up running the simulation for 50 nanoseconds longer. And again, you can see that main RMSD plot there, again, seems to have this plateau towards the second half of the simulation. And then also, um, I did that pairwise RMSD, and I saw that this really dark area um, indicating this area of convergence right here highlighted in the red box. And so in order to visualize what the structure looked like, I did something called cluster, clustering analysis in Chimera. And so this tries to cluster together similar structures in the simulation. So what you see here is a visualization of one of those clusters, which corresponds to the dark region in the pairwise RMSD. So I did the cluster between about 80 nanoseconds and 120 nanoseconds. And this is the average structure for that cluster shown here in the green. So even though these are both the exact same sequence. I thought it was interesting that one of the terms I had this alpha helix while the other didn't. I'm not really sure why that happened, but this is only one simulation, so we're going to need to repeat it. And then also on the right here is a surface view of the representative structure from that cluster. And I thought it was funny because it almost looks like they're giving each other a hug here. And so since I saw that potential interaction between the C and C termini combination, of the HXT4 protein, I wanted to see if the residues involved in the bonds between them were conserved among orthologous sequences. And so orthologous sequences are proteins that all share a common ancestor. And so the idea here is that if the residue is more conserved among other species than the same clade, then that means that they're more vital for a protein's function. And so I won't go into all the specifics, but essentially what I did was get similar sequences to HST4 from a blast search. And then I did some quality filtering and got the highest scoring sequence from each species. And then I built a file genetic tree and got the sequences from the proteins that were in the same clade as HXT4. And so what you're looking at here is called a web logo. And it's a way of visually representing sequence conservation where the larger the letter, the more conserved that amino acid is at that position. And so you can see that overall the C terminus have more conservation than the N terminus. And I thought this was interesting since the C termini were the ones that we saw interacting in the actual simulation. And so I looked at two different types of bonds within that cluster of convergence, the hydrogen bonds and salt bridges. And so hydrogen bonds occur between a hydrogen that's connected to an electronegative atom, which we call the donor, and then a lone pair on another electronegative atom that we call the acceptor. And so they aren't particularly strong on their own, but when they combine, they can help to provide structure stability to the proteins. And so here in the first graph, you can see a bubble plot of hydrogen bonding between the C and C termini combinations of HXC4, where residue numbers for the donors are on the x-axis and the acceptor residues are on the y-axis. And then here, the size of the bubble is based on the percent identity conservation of the donor residue multiplied by the percent identity conservation of the acceptor, multiplied by the occupancy of that hydrogen bond, as long as the occupancy was above 30%. And here, occupancy just means in what percentage of the frames was a particular hydrogen bond present. And so it looks like there might be several important residues involved in hydrogen bonding, including arginine 552 and tryptophan 541. And so I did the same thing for salt bridges, and then salt bridges are just another type of non-covalent bonding. And this occurs between a positively charged and negatively charged amino acid. And so again, I saw arginine 552, this time in a salt bridge with aspartic acid 555. So arginine 552 may be important for C to C termini interactions. But again, this is only one simulation run, so we're going to need to run it, replicate it more times just to make sure that we have the complete sampling space. Um, and then to make it easier to generate all the files that you need to do the MD simulations, 
I wrote this tool called TRAITS, and it stands for Transporter Terminalized Simulations. Um, it's PIP installable and it's available on GitHub. So just to wrap up our overall conclusions, um, what Kobe saw was that the HXT4 protein may initiate oligomerization through C2C terminal interactions. And what I saw was that the HXT overexpressor exhibits a similar respiration defect as the RVS-161 delete mutant. However, this defect is more important in the downstream effect of glucose metabolism rather than the function of the transporter itself. Similarly, nitroxyl and BME affect the amount of hexose transporters mobilized to the plasma membrane, which may affect glucose uptake in the cell. So for future research, um, we, we want to repeat the experiments and then the simulations multiple times. And that's just to give more data so that we can have a better understanding of what might actually be happening. And then for the simulation, I want to text, um, test other HXTs. So that could include HXT1, HXT2, and HXT3. Um, which I've already started at HSC1, just to see if it's similar to HSC4. And then we're going to do some localization experiments just to see on um, the relationship between the RBS161 delete and then other HSC proteins. And then also we're going to transform the GFP mutant onto the HSC4 um, protein so that we can actually look at HSC4 itself. And then we're going to look for alternative ways to measure glucose uptake um, other than radioactively labeled ones. And so these are just our references, and then we have a few people we want to acknowledge. So first we want to say a big thank you to Dr. Swain. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Patu um, for her help with all the computational stuff, because I could not have done the simulations and any of that stuff without her help. Also, thank you to Dr. Gearhart for helping me in part of my experiments. Um, thank you, Noah, for all the good conversations and also helping me with the salt bridges code. And then I want to thank Rob Howaller for helping us with the supercomputer. And then I want to say thank you to SC Embry as I started some of this research this past summer and so it was funded by them. <laughs>